My name is Jennifer King, and I'm honored to be one of the authors of Chapter 29, Decolonizing First People's Child Welfare, together with Cindy Blackstock, Terry Leibsman, Brittany Matthews, and Wendy Hermiston. I'm speaking to you today from unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, otherwise known as Ottawa, Canada. Our chapter aims to bring to light the duplicity of colonial government's claims to support human rights and equality for First Peoples, children in Canada and Australia, while at the same time, not only perpetuating, but vigorously defending inequality. And this is done through a variety of means. In Australia, despite official apologies to members of the stolen generations, colonial values remain deeply embedded in the government response. Successive Australian governments have perpetuated harms to First Peoples by failing to make adequate reparations or to implement the necessary child welfare law and funding reforms to prevent repetition, despite research and inquiries outlining exactly what is required. In Canada, using the example of a landmark human rights case, we demonstrate that federal treatment of First Nations children is one of willful discrimination and inequity characterized by a pattern of ignoring the evidence, choosing not to act on solutions, and using good words to deflect accountability. Canada chooses to privilege the best interests of the colonial government over the well-being of First Nations children, even when these choices are known to cause harm. In both contexts, deep-set colonial mindsets have and continue to impede the translation of law, policy, and self-determination into practice. We conclude by asserting that pathways toward equity and justice require all people in Canada and Australia to do the hard work of interrogating mindsets and that the public in both countries hold the governments to account for meaningful change. Thank you. <laughs>